Uh, my name is Bill Carlazon. I'm a, a neuroscientist, a neurobiologist, and my lab is based at McLean Hospital. And um, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be here today to start the conversation about how we begin integrating basic neuroscience and some of the wonderful concepts uh, that have been uh, introduced today to us. So if I could have my slides, thank you. So again, the panel is Advancing Human, uh, Animal-Human Translational Science. And my particular talk is uh, the use of continuous telemetry to enhance animal models of psychiatric illness. So my goal is to give a, a brief interview of this field, our field, and then get you as soon as possible to the next speakers who are all doing really highly innovative work uh, in this field. So my disclosures, uh, none of these are relevant to what I'll be discussing today. So it's late in the afternoon. Um, I thought it would be fun to start with a 45 second film clip from a movie that was made in 1968. Those of you who are from my era will recognize this immediately as being from 2001, A Space Odyssey. So when this movie came out 50 years ago now, it showed some of the best guesses with respect to the types of technologies that would be available to us someday in the distant future. So what you're gonna see here, again, it's only 45 seconds, uh, is a conversation between the astronaut, that's the astronaut Dave, and the computer that's running the ship, which is known as HAL. The two are chatting about the mission before HAL breaks in with an alert. Of course I am. Sorry about this. I know it's a bit silly. Just a moment. Just a moment. I've just picked up a fault in the AE-35 unit. It's going to go 100% failure within 72 hours. Is it still within operational limits right now? Yes. And it will stay that way until it fails. Would you say we have a reliable 72 hours to fail? Yes. That's a completely reliable figure. Well, then I suppose we'll have to bring it in, but first I'd like to go over this with Frank and get on a mission control. But let me have the hard copy on it, please. Okay, in case the audio was difficult to hear, Hal forecasted that the ship's main communication antenna was going to fail in 72 hours, and Dave devised a plan to service it before it would fail. So what we have here is a device, HAL, a computer, continuously collecting and monitoring data, which enables it to identify a crisis that will occur in the future in something that would otherwise appear to be functioning completely normally. So this is exactly what we want to do in psychiatry. So here's a model um, of what we really want to do in psychiatry, which is forecasting uh, future illness-related behaviors. So Consider for a minute event B, which we're calling the seed or the reference event. Event A precedes event B. What we want to know was event B predictable on the basis of event A. And if so, can we extend the time uh, at which we can, this pr uh, prediction is useful? Obviously, event A can predict something that happens a couple of seconds later, event B. But what we want to know is, can we do what Hal did, which was expend, extend this time, not to seconds, but to days or weeks even. So likewise, event C follows event B. And what we'd like to know is event B, or the combination of event A plus B, is predictive of event C. And if so, can we extend the, the time we can work with? <clears throat> So these are the types of events that we were, were thinking about when we do neuroscience research, because these are things we can study in the lab. Um, sleep, locomotor activity, body temperature, EEG spectral power, and things like this. Why are we focused on these? Well, again, we can study them in our, in our lab animals, rats and mice, but they're also exactly the types of data that we've heard all about today that can be collected on smartphones and Fitbits. And I wanted to mention that these Fitbits and smartphones, they're improving at all times. So what's possible today um, 
may be much different from what's possible in the future. So how do we do this in the lab? Obviously, we can't outfit our rats and mice with cell phones or Fitbits, but we're doing the next best thing. We're implanting them with transmitters, usually right into the intra intraperitoneal cavity, that can provide continuous data streams. So um, this, particular, uh, this particular transmitter has a battery inside and wires coming from it. That battery will last for six weeks. So this is the business model of the company that we work with. The battery has a limited time, and when we're done, we have to send the, send the transmitter back for replacement. Um, but during that six weeks, it's collecting data continuously at all times, and we're just getting tons and tons of data from these animals. So we use these four wires. Two of them we use for EEG, um, and two of them we use for EMG, which is muscle movement. And again, it's implanted uh, beneath the skin or in the intraperitoneal cavity of the animal. And the combination of these metrics enable us to make judgments about whether the animal's, the animal's vigilance state. So is the animal awake or asleep? <clears throat> when the transmitter is in proximity with the receiver, so we place the receiver under the cage of the animal, the, uh, the transmitter just beams a signal, an, uh, an AM signal to the receiver, and it's all integrated and it, it prints out or it's displayed on a computer. So this is what the data interface looked like. So there's several important um, pieces of data here. There's the EEG signal up here. There's the EMG signal down here. So you can see the animal's not moving, and then there's a period of movement, and then the animal is uh, more quiescent. And then this middle frame here is the computer's analysis of what's going on, what the vigilance state of the animal is. So P stands for paradoxical sleep. So paradoxical sleep is essentially REM sleep without the rapid eye movement measurement. So this is something that we do not collect in our mice, but everything else is the same. It's just called paradoxical sleep. A is for active, and S is for slow wave sleep. So again, to emphasize here, these data streams are continuous and highly objective. Um, whereas a lot of the uh, behavioral tests that we do uh, often in our animal models are, are far from objective. They require a lot of subjective ratings. So as I mentioned, when we put these things together, we get EEG, EMG, and we're able to make judgments about what the vigilance state of the animal is. There's other data sets that are coming along as well. We're getting measurement of their uh, locomotor activity in the cage. And because we're collecting these data continuously, what we're able to do is, is uh, organize them according to, today, to days and compress numerous days and express them uh, in this way. And what you begin to see is that there are very regular patterns of uh, uh, diurnal rhythms of, of activity. So again, mice are nocturnal. So they're sleeping mostly during the day. The activity is very low. And then they're active at nighttime when it's dark. And what you can see is there's a bump in activity, and then it goes down for a few, for a couple of hours, and then it comes back up. This is a normal circadian or diurnal rhythm of locomotor activity. And we also get body temperature, and the body temperature also shows a circadian or diurnal rhythm uh, of, uh, of, of temperature change. But these turn out to be very important measures that we're getting along uh, at the same time as we are looking at sleep. So just to point out that uh, I mentioned that the data are continuous and objective, but they're also highly translational because sleep microstructure is pretty similar in rats and mice and humans. It's measured and defined in the same ways by the presence of these uh, power bands. Uh, again, this is important to point out because a lot of the behavioral tests that we use in psychiatry bear a little resemblance to the uh, actual human condition being studied. So I don't want to dwell on this too long. I just wanted to mention that one of the ways we're using this system is, uh, is to understand some of how some of the brain-specific uh, changes in response to stress can uh, affect sleep. So we all understand intuitively how disruptive poor sleep can be to our mood, putting at risk for all kinds of maladaptive behaviors. We want to understand the neural circuits that can affect sleep 
So we're using a genetic engineering technique called DREADS, and this enables us to basically install artificial receptors on distinct cell types in the brain and use those receptors to excite or inhibit these cells in ways that mimic the effects of stress. And we really, to be, in order to be able to do this and to come to firm conclusions, we need this continuous data stream where we're looking at days, uh, over days at how sleep changes. So this is another way that we're using uh, these types of continuous data streams. What is depicted here are daily temperature changes, cycles, in three rats, three mice per group, and this is collected over a period of 27 days. So when Galen Missig, who collected these data in the lab, brought these data to us, he kind of quizzed us. He said, what, what is different about these two groups, group A and group B? So if you look at it, you can get a sense that there's something kind of different about it, but it can be a little bit hard to pick out. It looks like group A, the rhythms are more regular, and group B, there's days of variability, but interspersed in there, there's an occasional um, day where there's less variability in the temperature. And when you add the information that the top is males and the top is females, it starts to come together a little bit more. Um, it's not occasional days, it's actually every fourth day. And something that happens in mice every fourth day is the estrus cycle. So when you project it out this way, you can very easily see how reliable these, these daily and weekly uh, cycles are in terms of body temperature and how regular that estrus cycle comes up in females. Um, so if you're really paying attention, oh, that's the estrous cycle. If you're really paying attention, you might notice this particular day in here, and what that represents is a cage change. So we have to change the, the cages of these mice uh, every, every so often because they get quite dirty. As neuroscientists, we like to think that that's a totally innocuous uh, manipulation where we just give the, the mice some fresh bedding in their cage but it disrupts uh, the body temperature for at least a day, so it's not so innocuous. So we use these type of data <clears throat> to um, study the lifelong consequences of early developmental immune activation. And you remember that I mentioned that there's a circadian or diurnal um, uh, phase, uh, cycle of body temperature. And what you can see is that when we give early developmental immune activation, this doesn't change this daily cycle at all. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't change it during anestrus in females, and it doesn't change it during estrus cycle in females. So estrus is uh, associated with the hyperactivity, and what you can see, uh, again, data collected over many weeks is that you see this pattern during anestrus, where it has that little inflection point and then comes back up. And during estrus, uh, there is no such inflection point, and thus during that period of time, activity levels are much higher. So as it turns out, when we look at the effects of perinatal immune activation using this measure, in females, we can see that at one very specific time point, there's a tremendous increase in activity as a consequence of this early uh, immune activation, whereas otherwise it's completely silent. That manipulation, you can't tell anything happened to the animals except for during this one very brief period um, that's associated with a body temperature change. So this type of relationship enables us to begin to, to, um, to formulate very primitive forecasting um, Nothing nearly as sophisticated as we heard today about um, uh, w that's possible in humans, but I think it, it, it shows that we're on the right track here to be able to forecast and predict behavior. So early immune activation, um, and you, when you combine that with peak diurnal temperature, you get a maximal sensitivity to, perturba to perturbation. And what we want to do in the lab is start studying these other psychiatry-relevant endpoints during these times, like impulsivity behavior, hyperarousal, depression behavior, and anxiety behavior. These are associated with the types of behaviors such as suicide and drug addiction that are really prevalent and devastating in humans, so we want to be able to develop animal models where we can predict um, these types of behaviors. Um, it's important to emphasize, this is my last slide, that um, these technologies already exist 
and in many ways we're already immersed in them. So I started with a film clip and I'll end with an anecdote. When you go to Disney World these days, you get one of these. So this is a wearable um, and when you wear it, it gets you into the park, it gets you onto rides, it gets you into your room. Uh, you can use it at stores to buy gifts or food or whatever you want, there's, there's no need for cash. Um, but it should be obvious to all of us in this room, especially after today, that these things are actually tracking us. They're tracking us around wherever we go. And currently at Disney World, it's used for really benign purposes. So when you're leaving a ride, it, you, it flashes up on a screen, goodbye, and the system identifies who's in the car as you're leaving the ride. And then when you get past a certain point, the next, the, there's a message for the people behind you. But it's all made possible because these devices are, are, are tracking where you are. Um, so in my case, these devices could just as easily be delivering forecasted, forecasting related uh, promotional or marketing materials. So based on my previous behaviors during other days, it, it might be able to forecast that I really, at the end of this ride, I need to know where the coffee shop is. But I think we're all in agreement that the true power of this type of technology is when it can be used to deliver medically urgent messages. So it can, devices like this and cell phones and Fitbits can help us understand the behaviors that precede or forecast um, difficult psychiatric difficulties like relapse. They can alert the patient, they can alert families, and they can alert caregivers. And again, the point would be to make this type of alert occur way in advance, not seconds in advance, but just like how the computer could predict it days in advance or a week in advance. And that's when I think these, these devices will be uh, particularly useful. So in my lab, and I think you're gonna hear from other speakers today um, who are doing the type of work that wanna make sure that neuro, the neuroscience of this lines up with all of the clinical potential. So I just want to thank all the people uh, who have people and organizations who have supported this work, and bring up next speaker, who is Bob Data from Harvard Medical School.